The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. Customer phoning a company representative to complain about her new purchase. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, is this the Dynamo Motorcycle Company? Yes, it is. How can I help you? Well, I have an instruction manual here for your new electric motorcycle, but I'm not satisfied with the purchase at all. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but don't worry. I'm sure we can sort this out. Before we do anything, can you tell me the model number? Ah, at the top of the instruction manual here, it gives the model number RTY34. RTY34.、Uh, OK. Now, what's the nature of your complaint? It's many things, actually. The biggest problem is that you say in your manual that the battery will take the motorcycle 30 kilometres. That's right. Well, it's lucky to take me eight. The battery is usually flat by then. Often leaving me stuck at the side of the road. Are you sure you're charging it correctly? I'm fairly sure. I follow all the instructions and plug it in for a long time. And are you sure you charge it for the required three hours? I charge it until the charging light goes off, and that's two hours. So that should be enough. And there's a serious design fault with this motorcycle. When you're riding it, there's no meter to show you how much power is left, so you actually don't know when the machine is going to stop working. There's a voltage gauge. Yes, but that tells you nothing. The needle fluctuates about from 55 to 45, so whatever it says is meaningless. According to the manual, you're meant to charge the battery if the needle falls under 50 volts. But even when you charge it, it can go below 45. As I said, the needle just waves all over the place. The result is that I'm always worried that the bike will leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sure, but what are you going to do about it? Unfortunately, we don't have a refund policy. But if you take the bike to one of our shops, our mechanics will look at it. Perhaps there's a problem that we can fix. The gauge, for example. The other problem is the battery. I actually weighed it, and it's almost six kilograms. Yet you say in your manual that it weighs only three. I can barely pick the thing up, so it's not three kilograms at all. Maybe you purchased the wrong model by mistake. I doubt that very much. Basically, I think I've been defrauded, and I'd like to know what you're going to do about it. All right, I'll put you through to our complaints department. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Hello. Complaints department here.、Uh, apparently, you have a complaint. Yes, I do. Let me tell you all about. It's it's all right. Our representative has already informed me about your problem. It's probably just a misunderstanding. I'm sure we can work something out. Right now, I need to take down some details. All right. Can I have your name, please? Jesse Parkinson. That's J E double S I E and Parkinson, P A R K I N S O N. Parkinson. All right. What shall we list this complaint under? Parts, service, or performance? 
Well, the meter isn't accurate at all, so that's parts, isn't it? Yes, perhaps, but you do feel more generally that the motorcycle doesn't meet the operational standards as advertised, so it's probably better to tick performance here. Can we tick both, parts and performance? No, we can only tick one, so let's not call it parts. We'll go with performance. Now, we may post some further forms and questionnaires to you, so would you mind giving me your address? Certainly, it's 45 Melrose Road. Melrose, M-E-L and Rose. OK, now, your phone number? Just use my mobile phone. That's 0928982. Four five three. Four five three. OK, and if we have any follow-up questions, what time is best for ringing you? Morning? Afternoon? Night time? Well, I work as a secretary from 9 to 5, but I do get a lunch break which gives me some free time. This break used to be 12.30 to 1.30, but then it changed to an hour later, so it's best to ring me at 2pm since the break now starts at 1.30. All right. Uh, that's all for now. We just need to do our own investigation and we'll probably ring you back tomorrow. I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now... We don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well, or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary.
But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday, or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum, summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, you'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception, and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of Part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an interview on job application. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. These days it's hard enough to find a suitable job, let alone get as far as an interview. Dozens of people every day send off their curriculum vitae or application form and wait hopefully to be summoned for an interview. Now this, apparently, is where a lot of people fall down because of their inadequacy at completing their application forms, according to Judith Davidson, author of Getting a Job, a popular book which has recently come onto the market. Our reporter Christopher Shields decided to look into this apparent inability of the British to sell themselves, and he spoke to Judith Davidson about it. Judith Davidson lectures at a management training college for young men and women, most of whom have just graduated from university and gone there to take a crash course in management techniques. One of the hardest things is not passing the exams, not passing the course examinations successfully, but actually finding employment afterwards. So Judith now concentrates on helping trainees to set about doing just this and she tries to work out the reasons why chances of getting a job are pretty small. Very often a job application or a curriculum vitae will contain basic grammatical or careless spelling mistakes, even from university graduates. Then those that do get as far as an interview become inarticulate or clumsy when they try to talk about themselves. It doesn't matter how highly qualified or brilliant you may be, if you come across as tongue-tied and gauche, your chances are quite slim. What are other problems of the application forms? Some letters are dirty and untidily written, with finger marks all over them and ink blots or even coffee stains. Others arrive on lined or flowered or sometimes scented paper, none of which is likely to make a good impression on the average business-like boss. Many people are unable to make that initial impact with an employer. In fact, it needs techniques to send an application which will stand out from the rest and persuade the employer you're the right one for the job. This prompted an enterprising young man called Mark Ashworth, a recruitment consultant himself, to start writing job applications for other people for a fee. As a Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. He told me he got the idea in America, where it's already big business, and in the last few months alone he's written over 35 CVs. He feels that 80% of job applications received by personnel managers are inadequate in some way. Well, yes, many people simply can't cope with grammar and spelling and don't know what to put in or leave out. Sometimes people condense their work experience so much that a future employer doesn't know enough about him. Then, on the other hand, some people go too far the other way. To give you an example, one CV I once received in my recruiting role was getting on for 30 pages long. Mark has an initial interview with all his clients in which he tries to make them think about their motivation. He can often exploit these experiences in the CV he writes for them and shows that they have been valuable preparation for the job now sought. He also believes that well-prepared job history and a good letter of application are absolutely essential. Among the most important aspects of applications are spelling, correct grammar, content and layout. A new boss will probably also be impressed with a good reference or a letter of commendation written by a former employer. The type of CV I aim to produce depends largely on the kind of job being applied for. They don't always have to be slick or highly sophisticated, but in certain cases this does help. Judith Davidson thought very much along the same lines as Mark. In her opinion, 
One of the most important aspects of job applications was that they should be easy to read. Many applicants send in letters and forms which are virtually unreadable. The essence of handwritten application is that they should be neat, legible, and the spelling should be accurate. I stress handwritten because most employers want a sample of their future employees' writing. Many believe this gives some indication of the character of the person who wrote it. Some people forget vital things like putting their own address or the date. Others fail to do what's required of them by a job advertisement. Judith believes that job seekers should always send an accompanying letter along with their application forms, stating clearly why their qualifications make them suitable for the vacancy. Personal details have no place in letters of application. I well remember hearing about one such letter, which stated quite bluntly, "I need more money to pay for my flat." No boss would be impressed by such directness. She added that the art of applying for jobs successfully was having to be learnt by more and more people these days, with the current unemployment situation. With as many as two or three hundred people applying for one vacancy, a boss would want to see only a small fraction of that number in person for an interview. So your application had to really outshine all the others to get you on the short list. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today, in our series of lectures on nature history, we are going to be looking at amber. Do you know amber? What is it? How is it formed? What are the uses of amber? Firstly, what is amber? Amber is fossilized resin from ancient forests. Amber is not produced from tree sap, but rather from plant resin. This aromatic resin can drip from trees, trapping debris such as seeds, leaves, feathers, and insects. The resin becomes buried and fossilized through progressive natural changes. Therefore, amber is formed as a result of the fossilization of resin that takes millions of years. Although a specific time interval has not been established for this process. The majority of amber is found approximately thirty to ninety million years ago. You may ask why resin is produced. Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, it is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury caused by insects and fungi. Resin may be produced to heal a wound, such as a broken branch. And resins have odors or tastes that both attract and repel insects. Resin may also be produced as a plant's method to dispose excess acetate. We know that amber survives millions of years, but what type of depositional environment preserved amber? One depositional environment for amber is marginal marine. Amber's specific gravity is slightly over one, and it floats in salt water. Therefore, amber becomes concentrated in marine deposits, moved some distance from the original site. 
trees and resin may be transported and deposited in quiet water sediments. Wood and resin are buried under the sediment, and while the resin becomes amber, the wood becomes coal. Wet sediments of clay and sand preserve the resin well because they are devoid of oxygen. So, as a precious product of nature, what are the uses of amber? In ancient times, amber was used for medicine. Honey was mixed with powdered amber and prescribed for many chronics like asthma, gout, and the Black Plague. It was also used as precious decoration. The amber jewelry was thought to have the magic power against evil and dark forces. Sailors burned amber on ships to drive away sea monsters and the dangers of the deep. Amber has retained its beauty for millions of years, but if not preserved well, it may lose its charm. The softness and brittleness is likely to be attacked by chemicals and requires some special care in handling and storing. So do not put your amber jewelry on before hairspray and perfume is applied, because it will likely create a whitish coating on the amber that may be permanent. If you want to string the amber beads on silk or linen thread, remember to string them with knots between each bead to prevent mutual rubbing and chipping. Amber jewelry should not be stored where it can rub against metal or other jewelry, and storage in a soft cloth is best. Never put amber jewelry in a steam cleaner, which would shatter the gem. Never let amber come in contact with soaps or commercial jewelry cleaning solutions, which can dull the finish. Keep amber away from common kitchen substances such as salad oil, butter, and excessive heat of ovens and burners. Dust and sweat can be removed with clean, cool water and a soft cloth. Never use hot water. The amber can be dried and rubbed with clear olive oil, then rubbed with a soft cloth to remove excess oil and restore the polish. The last thing I'd like to mention is the storing of amber. Amber should not be placed near heating ducts or in direct sunshine, and avoid exposure to sudden changes of temperature. Well, that's all for amber today. Hope you enjoy this precious product of nature and have the luck to own one. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.